It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 254 at block height 668,523 on Sunday, January 31st. So what is up today, Janine? It has been a week. I feel like a good chunk of the entire show today is going to be about one very expansive topic. Chicken tenders. <laughs> so yeah, I, I I literally don't even know where to start here. Um. <laughs> I think we should start with the chicken tender initiation ritual. I I, I don't think I've been initiated. Uh, not not quite sure what you mean. So there is a uh, well, uh, in answer to someone who was not clear on what the term tendies meant yesterday um i mean i had already had the impression that it was uh referring to this wall street bets thing because i saw a tweet that was kind of mocking people from wall street bets as chicken tender eating degenerates but uh then i you know went searching a bit and i came across uh well i guess you could call it a poem or a song or what have you from Wall Street Bets from two years ago, and it is titled Tendies for Everyone. Um, and it is a piece of art. <laughs> so I feel like I should read at least a portion of it. I would concur. All right, so it goes, Gimme, gimme, chicken tendies, be they crispy or from Wendy's. Spend my hard-earned good boy points on kids' meal ball pit burger joints. Mommy lifts me to the car to find me tendies near and far. Enjoy my tasty tendy treats in comfy big boy booster seats. McDonald's, Hardee's, Popeye's, Cane's, but of my tendies, none remains. So I am totally going to have to like venture out through two feet of snow to get chicken tenders today after, after this. Yeah. I don't have uh, chicken tenders. I do have chicken, though. But yeah, I mean, th- this is um, this is one of the craziest things I have ever seen in my life. Like, I mean, like seriously. Um, I think you should oh, explain <laughs> what's been happening. <laughs> well, well, first, um, the, the archivists the are going to be very confused. Like a a trader on a subreddit who has been massively long GameStop for over a year sniffed around and found out that a hedge fund was massively short GameStop and uh so was born a meme (laughs) I mean I I have never in my life seen something as crazy as just mass mobs of retail investors buying up a stock just to fuck over a hedge fund. Like. (laughs) Yeah. And just to kind of give perspective on how fucked they got. um, I saw a journalist, I think from the New York times. I can't recall. I'll get it after I quote Lee or after I badly quote it. But, uh, Apparently, the losses from this um, have been greater than the GDP of Germany. Yep. So far. But I, I mean, it's just like okay, we 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 need to establish a, a timetable here because this is going to go all over the place with the different um, aspects we're going to get into. So, a year or so ago, Trader goes long GameStop happens to be on Wall Street bets very frequently. 
last week found out that a major hedge, or hedge fund was short GameStop. And so starts memeing Wall Street bets to pump the shit out of GameStop to fuck the hedge fund. Um, this hedge fund has in the past gone massively short Tesla. So enter Elon Musk, who memes GameStonk on Twitter. And the fucking price just pumps even more. And then they just start scattering off into all kinds of other shit. I mean, a- AMC, um, the theater that was going to go bankrupt, got pumped by this. Um, they paid Doge off a seven hundred million dollar debt, apparently. Yeah, like th- this. This literally saved AMC from bankruptcy because they they took shares. And use that to to draw down a massive amount of debt that they've built up over the last year. So they they have wiped all the debt off their balance sheet. And then Dogecoin got into the mix um, somewhere in there. And I I think the new target is short squeeze silver. (laughs) Yeah. So according, there's a tweet from a Dogecoiner that I saw that says, Father Elon will take us to the dollar. Which I found hilarious. So if anyone who doesn't know Dogecoin, uh, it's like what a couple cents now, something like that. And their goal right now is to get Dogecoin to go to a dollar. Um, which I mean, it's hilarious to me because like Bitcoiners are talking about the moon, and I think Jameson Lop said something uh, after Elon added Bitcoin to his Twitter bio. He said something like, "Oh, we're not aiming for the moon anymore. We're aiming for Mars." <laughs> Meanwhile, Dogecoiners are aiming for the dollar. <laughs> like they're trying to get just as good as the dollar. Yeah, I do not in any universe see that happening. Um, I I think a lot of people in the Dogecoin frenzy here have completely forgotten that Dogecoin is merge mined with Litecoin. Um, And so when it pumps like this, it's kind of just free extra money for Litecoin miners that they're probably just going to dump because Doge randomly pumps all the time and then crashes again. Yep. And in the midst of all this, um, I mean, most of it has been on Wall Street bets, but I think there was some confusion about whether it had been taken down or not. And so it's been showing up other places, but there's been a bunch of posts that I've read on Reddit that are basically just these like really angry uh, declarations from people who say that they're participating in this and that, you know, they're buying whatever, hundred, two hundred dollars of these GameStop shares and saying like, I don't care if I lose that money. Like they're not doing it because they think they're going to get rich. They're doing it because they just want to participate in fucking over these hedge funds. Mm -hmm. And And they're like, this is payback for 2008. Yep. And one one of the interesting things about these hedge funds too, is some of the, uh, the connections, if if you want to get into between, say, Citadel that bailed out uh, Melvin Capital, which got blown out when this started, um, Citadel's relationship with Robinhood, um, their history with the Treasury Secretary. Yeah, so I haven't looked into that too much, but I believe the, I mean, the basic thing is that Citadel has funded robin hood they've received money from them and in fact i because the for anyone who doesn't know the way robin hood works is that you know it's meant for retail investors but uh one of the ways that they make money is by sharing your data i don't know whether it's personal information i think i read somewhere that that might be involved but they basically share you know the the trades that you are attempting to make or have made with you know, larger hedge funds who then use that information in their own trading decisions. And that's how, that's a part of how they make money. Yep. And it, it's really interesting how that works too, because I, I think the edge there is that legally, um, within some certain time frame, brokers or platforms operating order books are legally mandated 
to match the best order in some time period. Like whether that's a second, five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever. So by buying up that order data, they can absolutely front run retail. And legally, if they outbid retail, that is the order that has to be matched first. Mm -hmm. And so you can see why uh, it's quite confusing for a company that operates like this to be called Robinhood. Uh, as you know, that was a big part of a lot of the memes that came out of this is, you know, you have a company who is not taking from the rich to give to the poor, they're taking from the poor to give to the rich. And uh, first of all, as a person who is very, like, I'm a very big fan of the Robin Hood folktales, I've seen pretty much every uh, interpretation there is, I've read like the, or I've tried to read the oldest English texts of that that I could find that were still in English that I could read. And there's kind of a misconception about Robin Hood in this kind of this, you know, this catchphrase about stealing from the rich to the gift to the poor. That's actually not the whole story because the Robin Hood legends weren't about him just going around stealing from rich people. In fact, a lot of them there, I mean, there's Robin Hood isn't any singular person. There was a lot of people and kind of variations of him that were connected to actual people that came about over centuries. Um, but for most, like a lot of them, he was actually a nobleman himself. Um, and he wasn't going around stealing from rich people in quotes in general. He was actually um, <laughs> he was actually taking back tax money from the government, and of course, the government in that time period was often noblemen. So yes, the government was made of the rich people, but he wasn't in particular stealing from rich people. He was taking back tax money when you know people couldn't afford to eat. Um, so actually he's a, he's, it's more of a anti-government story than anti-rich man story. Um, and I found it quite funny. There's a Twitter account called Robin Hood at Robin Hood. Um, and it's for the kind of Robin Hood society that's actually based in the UK. And I guess a lot of people were following them <laughs> during this whole, uh, uh, crisis and so they actually tweeted out about hey we just like to remind you that this is the worldwide robin hood society in nottingham and not the robin hood app but welcome <laughs> and i thought that was really cute yeah that is an interesting way that um history was kind of whitewashed there to uh give a different slant than it originally had mm -hmm. but what about the uh, the connection to Janet Yellen in here? Uh, yeah, there is uh, quite a problematic connection, uh, which is, um, this is just quoting directly from Politico, January 1st of this year. Um, they reported that in the past two years, President-elect Joe Biden's pick to the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, has ranked in, raked in more than $7.2 million in speaking fees from Wall Street and large corporations, including Citi, Goldman Sachs, Google, Citi National Bank, UBS, Citadel, eh -eh, LLC, Barclays, Credit Suisse, and Salesforce, and more. Yellen's financial disclosure is one of the three uh, filed by the Biden team at the end of 2020 that could become politically problematic with the left, left wing of the Democratic Party when confirmation hearings begin in January. A Biden transition official said they filed the forms midweek before the Office of Government Ethics posted the forms late Friday, blah, blah, blah. Yellen, the former uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, brought in nearly $1 million, giving nine speeches to Citi alone. She earned more than 100000 speaking to Citadel, a hedge fund founded by the Republican mega-donor Ken Griffin. She also spoke to the law and lobbying firm Pillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw, Pittman. So, yeah, and for anyone who, I mean, I'm pretty sure most people listening understand this already, but, um, yeah, you... These kinds of people, when they get paid to speak, they are not getting paid for the value of their speech. Um, in case you didn't know, it's more of a bribe. <laughs> so that's why uh, it is quite problematic given this situation. 
uh, that she has been paid a lot of money by one of the parties involved in this whole kerfuffle. And on the uh, last couple of days, um, I can't remember when, but Kenneth Vogel from the New York Times posted a copy of her ethics agreement um, from December 2020. And he said, unless Janet Yellen receives a written waiver, she will be barred by her ethics agreement from participating in any matter involving Citadel, which makes millions in frees from Robin Hood um, until October 2021 or one year after her paid, her last paid speech. Um, so her la the last time she spoke and made money from Citadel was just October last year. So she has to wait until October this year before she can be involved in any matter as Treasury Secretary. Uh, if Citadel's there. Um, and then Matt Stoller, um, who quote tweeted this um, from the American Economic Liberties Project, commented, um, yeah, she's the first female Treasury Secretary who has to be recused from an important market structure matter due to accepting speaking fees. Historic. <laughs> and this also reminds me, because uh, we actually just happened to watch a documentary about the Great Depression uh, last night, and I was not aware of this, but it turns out that um, the first chairman of the SEC, when it was formed by um, Roosevelt after the crash, um, Joseph Kennedy, he was publicly known at the time as being one of the major speculators who profited from the stock market crash, and his appointment to the SEC was described as setting a wolf to guard a flock of sheep, or actually I think in this documentary we watched, they said something like putting putting the fox in the hen house. And yeah, I just, I just laughed at that because I was like, uh, I think they even, one of the historians that they interviewed said something like, yeah, the, the, the SEC isn't there to investigate um financial fraud or financial crime they're there to <laughs> they're there to exonerate it <laughs> yep i guess this is a good point to kind of get into some of the uh issues so every, everybody knows now um about the the trading halts at, at robin hood and a number of other brokers um specifically though um i want to concentrate on robin hood they were incredibly vague about why they halted trading on these stocks in, in public us. appearances in the media they're protecting us shinobi they're protecting us from ourselves well, well see this is the weird thing though um a lot of other firms did the same thing but they actually explained what was really going on. So when you buy a stock somewhere like Robinhood, that's actually not settled for around two days. And it's that, that two day delay um, that kind of exposes brokers to a risk here. They actually have to have funds at a clearinghouse um, and a lot of this is mandated under the Dodd-Frank Act, actually, um, depending on the the amounts of outstanding orders um, versus sales summed out, um, looking at a, a collateral requirement for a certain percentage of that. And importantly, if a single equity or, or asset makes up, I think, over 30% of that net trade flow for everything they're doing, um, those requirements ratchet up. So you actually have to over collateralize versus just a normal trade flow with lots of different things. And so all of these firms that halted trading effectively halted trading because this exploding with just a handful of stocks like this um, ratcheted up all of their um, collateral requirements at clearing houses. And in addition to that, the clearing houses themselves actually increased collateral requ requirements outside of the, the increases that would have happened normally for certain stocks. So effectively, it, it was an issue of there, there was not enough money from all of these brokers 
at the clearinghouse to actually be able to guarantee the the liability. And that's effectively what happened there. But Robinhood was the, the one company that was really vague, did not explain what was going on in the background here. And I do want to point out here, um, didn't just halt trading, actually halted buying. Yeah. They, they, they still let you sell. And I have seen more accusations than I can count of margin positions that were closed out, even though there was no margin call. And I've even seen accusations of people's non-margin positions being sold by Robinhood without any interaction from them, which to my understanding is wildly illegal. So what the hell is going on there? Because Robinhood did a lot more than just freeze trading to cover their own ass and then collateralize with the clearing houses. They actively structured things so that you could only sell and push the market down. And specifically for GME, wasn't the whole kind of funny background on this that the the hedge funds that were short it were um, there was like an oh I can't remember the terminology but like they they were in a position that overestimated the total number of existing shares it was like a hundred and forty percent. Somebody was naked shorting, which means short selling stocks they don't know that that they actually have they don't know actually exist and the question i want to ask is who because especially with all this attention all the clearing houses aware of this and what's going on everybody having to look, look at what's actually going on here collateralize things those clearing houses have to know who is doing it so who was doing it? Because naked shorting is illegal. So somewhere in this pile uh, of shit, somebody was actually breaking the law here. And it's it only, was not Redditors. It's only illegal if you can't afford to pay the fines. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, I thought um, one of there was a really good segment with, I, I'm going to, I should have uh, checked how his name was spelled or pronounced because it was mentioned multiple times, but um, Chamath, Chamath, um, <laughs> he was on CNBC and I watched that whole segment because um, I guess they only ended up airing a portion of it, but the whole thing, the whole extended segment was really good. And something he said was that the solution to this is more transparency on the institutional side, not less accessibility for retail because the entire time he was talking on CNBC, a lot of the responses from the the anchor person he was talking to were about, oh, aren't, aren't the little guys going to get hurt? They don't really know what they're doing. And he was kind of countering that, saying like, you know, the, the, the guys who are at these hedge funds are actually not that much smarter in a lot of cases than the people in this subreddit. Like the assumption that they've done more research is clearly, uh, that's clearly being undermined here. <laughs> Yep. But it's like, you know, th- this whole situation is just bonkers. And I mean, like, I, I, I see like the whole what's the next thing. Um, I, I don't think that that's really going to happen or spread out too far. Um, like Dogecoin, that, that's not going to a dollar. Um, silver, that that's not happening. I mean, I, I would love to be proven wrong here, but yeah, I just, I do not see the, the silver market getting wrecked by this. Um, it's <laughs> just like gold, a giant manipulated paper market with fuck tons of naked shorting. Um, it, it's just not going to happen. But GME, like this is going to get really interesting how this continues to play out because, and, and it's this whole naked shorting aspect of it. Somebody out there was short without actually having access to the stock to cover it. Like rehypothecation happened somewhere in here. 
And a lot of the people on Wall Street bets at this point are openly speculating, like, maybe we legit do have so much of the outstanding GME shares that a large portion of these funds literally are incapable of covering their shorts if they don't sell. <laughs> yeah, as uh, Elizabeth Stark, I think she quoted someone else uh, who said this that had their account private, um, but she said, 2008, too big to fail, 2021, too small to win. Mm -hmm. that, that was one of the best quotes about this whole situation I've seen so far. I feel like we just have to read off some of our favorite memes or something that we encountered. Oh, man. My favorite one so far, it's too much about the picture. But have, have you ever seen um, Seven Psychopaths? No. <laughs> There's just this scene where Christopher Walken's like out in the middle of the desert and walking up to a rest stop. And he oh, walks yes. past the bed. Like, he just, put your yeah. hands up. No, but I have a gun. I don't care. <laughs> but that doesn't make any sense. Too bad. Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, so <laughs> so one of my favorites, um, I think she writes for The Times. But there's a woman whose name is Zoa Hedges Stocks like hedges um hyphen or dash hyphen hyphen i think yeah hyphen hyphen uh stocks and <laughs> apparently during this whole thing i don't know if she i she must have been either getting a lot of people following her getting people tweeting her i don't know just searching her I guess a lot of people were searching hedges and stocks and she had to tweet out, this is not a finance account. I do not have any trading advice. Hedges stocks is my surname, but uh, it was hilarious because below that, she also said something about how when she wrote for the times, she, there was all these jokes about how she should write for the finance section because of her name. I just thought that was great. <laughs> Did you see the, uh, the philosopher guy uh, one? Uh, I might have, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. Babe, will you please sell so we're millionaires? No, we must make them pay. Yeah, there's a there's been a few of those. Um, two that I have. Uh, one of them was just rich people. Why don't the poor just invest their money? Poor people. Okay, rich people. Wait, stop. <laughs> And then another one that kind of just encompasses everything that's been happening lately. Um, pandemic day 25. I made bread. Smiley face. Day 95. I sure do miss my friends. Day 310. The White House appears to be under the control of a shirtless man in a Viking helmet. Day 330. Reddit's coordinated attack on Wall Street is going as planned. <laughs> Alright, one, one more. Dave Chappelle is president. Just when, when you can't get $2,000 from the government, so you take it from the hedge funds they bailed out. Modern problems require modern solutions. <laughs> uh, my, my last one is just from the uh, WSB chairman account that got set up, which as far as I know is not actually, um, he's not actually the admin. It's just a Twitter account that got... Uh, Got some really good sound bites. Um, and he said, I got it wrong. It's not about occupying Wall Street. It's about leaving it. Oh, man. This is just like such a wild thing. I mean, like, this has literally done more in a week to bring awareness to this kind of corruption and these systemic problems to normies than Bitcoin has done in 10 years. And Bitcoin is just silently standing in the background just <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah i think uh another one i don't know i just have to keep reading <laughs> there's another one from uh ben kaufman where he said um so when the plebs do it it's market manipulation but when wall street does it then it's a sophisticated investment strategy yep that that is the hypocrisy of this entire situation right there but it's like, you know, it's not, nothing's going to happen here, though. And 
like you, you know what I mean? This this position, the squeeze is going to play itself out. Nobody's going to go to jail. Like no, nobody's going to get hit with anything except maybe a fine. And like th- this class action lawsuit against Robin Hood and these other brokers, I guarantee you there are clauses in their terms of service that say, sorry, nope, you can't do that. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, I didn't tweet out much myself. I was just kind of, I don't know, I that the last couple of days have been kind of passing in a daze because... I don't know. It's just so I wasn't participating, but it just was really funny, constantly 20, 24 seven laughs. Um, but one of the things I shared was a favorite quote of mine from a book called Forest, the Shadows, the Shadow of Civilization by Robert Harrison. I definitely recommend it. It's really good. It's basically about what forests have uh, like how forests have played a part in human history and how they're represented culturally. And he has a really big chapter about, um, or a section about Robin Hood. And so I thought it would be apt to share it. Um, And part of the quote says that, uh, um, let's see, where should I start? These outlaws of folklore were neither mere criminals nor enemies of justice. They appear in the legends as rebels challenging a law that had perpetrated injustices against them, hence as enemies not of the law, but rather of its degradation. The outlaw will not let... uh, not let stand the false compacts and confederacies of those raveners who dress up their profanity in the apparels of legitimacy. The motif of disguise creates a number of comic effects, but thematically it runs much deeper in these stories than would appear at first glance. The guile, tricks, and disguises in short, various ruses of deception that characterize the outlaw's strategies all seem to point to the same fundamental or underlying absurdity, namely the travesty of the law by its presumed custodians. Disguise, then, is first and foremost the scandal of the legal system. The outlaw assumes his own disguise in order to answer the system, reflecting through his ruses its own insidious deception. In short, he shadows the system. I feel like that's a... That's like a very sophisticated, a more sophisticated uh, description of Wall Street bets than the current bio, which is, I believe, uh, like when 4chan found a Bloomberg terminer, terminal. <laughs> Honestly, though, it's like w- one important thing here, though, that I think is just getting lost um, on most people in the meme. There is absolutely institutional money on both sides of this a hundred percent and it's like this got triggered by retail memes and and, you know kicking things off but like you know it, it is kind of um one of those situations if you are in this thinking you're gonna make money um it's kind of like a shit coin pump um you know, it's going to pump up and whales are going to dump on your head and most people are going to get wrecked. So I really hope that most of the people involved in this are of the mentality they don't care about making money. They're doing this to wreck these funds because those institutions are on both sides. Um, you do not get a $20 billion trading volume day to strip past Tesla as the most traded equity um, with just retail money. Yeah, and also don't be sucked into all the stupid idiots who are, you know, saying, oh, just go into trading crypto. Like, you have to remember that a lot of these exchanges, like, yeah, they're not the hedge funds, they're smaller, but it's still the same architecture that you don't control your keys and you're just like the number of people like I actually this is out of out of all the years I've been in Bitcoin this past week has been well and also this, this past month in general has been the most crazy for me in terms of people reaching out asking about like investing or trading or how to do that I'm just like don't like if I get the impression that they're going to do it anyway, regardless of whether I say don't do it, then I give them the best suggestion I can in terms of not how much money I think they will make or how much leverage <laughs> they might want, but it just in terms of like safety. Um, because yeah, it's like 
there's there's a mania and i i'm not i'm not putting my money into that mania at any point so i wouldn't recommend anyone else does unless you are purely doing this for the lulls yep and so i think to kind of transition out of this uh you know i, I think there was kind of some spillover um stress load into the crypto space from all of this uh yeah there was um i think he is from the new york no he's from blockworks um so someone from blockworks tweeted uh jason janowitz um tweeted out some screenshots of um kind of status reports from different exchanges i think in this case it was binance kraken and coinbase and i checked to make sure that those were actual tweets but yeah um, like I said, there are people who, as a result of this, are discovering or getting crazy about Bitcoin and other shit coins for the first time, thinking they're going to get rich. Um, and yeah, they're just kind of signing up to exchanges in order to do that. And yeah, surprise, surprise, we're still in the early days and there aren't that many of us. And so these exchanges were not ready for normies to be jumping onto them within a couple of days on, on basically no notice so they were saying yeah we've suspended withdrawals we're having connectivity issues uh apparently coinbase's web and mobile apps aren't working <laughs> very well so of course i don't think they ever work under any kind of stress whatsoever so that doesn't surprise me i would bet serious money that all of those people stampeding onto those exchanges are just there to buy Dogecoin. Yeah, there is a crazy amount of uh, interest from Zoomers in Dogecoin right now. I, I swear, like, I, I follow a decent amount of non Bitcoin people on Twitter, and I swear to God, I think every like non Bitcoiner I follow has been talking about Dogecoin the last few days. And like asking where you buy Dogecoin and how did they get Dogecoin? Wasn't there also someone from, I don't know if it was any of these exchanges, but I saw someone from an exchange asking like, hey, um, yeah, we can't really connect to the Dogecoin network. Does anyone have a Doge node? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like seriously, I mean, basically the rationale of all of these people, like their, their united rationale is... Well, Dogecoin is only a few cents, so if it doubles, that's, you know, like, it's going to take longer for Bitcoin to double. Dogecoin could double any day, and it's like, yeah, but it's also Dogecoin. <laughs> like, there's no network support. You're going to have to find an exchange that will actually honor you selling it eventually, and then you're going to have to deal with all the fun of capital gains, which you probably have never heard of. Oh, yeah. I can. I cannot wait for gamble. that. Short-term capital gamble. Short-term capital gains, too, not long-term. I cannot wait for that aspect of the fallout of all this Wall Street bet shit um, for all the people who are actually trying to make money off of this, trading in and out. Because like, think about it. If, if a bunch of, like, a lot of these people, they, you know, they say explicitly, I don't have a lot of money. I'm, like, a lot, if you're, if they're Zoomers, they're <laughs> college students or they're, recent college students who have a lot of debt and so if they you know they if they make a lot and then they sell and they don't know what they're doing they're going to have a giant tax bill and they're not going to have any fiat to pay it except for the fiat that they just sold if they manage to get that fiat at all yeah i like robin hood and that kind of shit has been exploding in general like all this year with the lockdowns and unemployment and i saw a piece on zero hedge uh last week it was pretty much just like interviewing millennial like zoomer day traders who started doing that last year and the entire Zoomers. article was what just like taxes what are taxes i don't know how that works i don't know i guess i have to figure that out now yeah and it's it's kind of like there there is a kind of truth to these you know cnbc mainstream establishment journalists saying oh but they're gonna they're gonna lose money they're gonna get wrecked like that is true 
but the way that they're criticizing it is like the basis on which they're doing that is wrong. The reason that no one or very few people know what they're doing when they're doing this and the consequences of it is because there is so much and has been so much resistance to allowing the average person to make investments. Like there's rules about how you can become an investor and you have to have a certain amount of money that basically locks out everyone except for the very rich. Like the problem here is that the government doesn't want the average person to participate in these markets and so they're all uninformed because they're just used to go to work, paycheck done. Like they're not informed about this because all of the incentives are telling them not to, that this is just a rich man's game. And so when you do get a couple smart people who aren't, you know, they don't, they don't need, a lot of them don't even have college degrees. Some of them don't even have high school degrees, but they were motivated enough to do their research and learn how to deal with this stuff. And yeah, they are beating them at their own game because at the end of the day, this is just about information. And if you can find the information first, then you win. If the market was fair, which it's not. That has also been another interesting discussion, which is about the difference between uh, capitalism, where you have a government that has imposed regulations that do not make the market free and an actual free market. A lot of red pills dropped this week. Already. Are we ready for the Blockstream happy hour? I don't know how we could get any happier. Upgrades! So, Blockstream Green um, has had a major architectural change. Um, for those who don't know, um, the entire wallet was originally built um, pretty much as a normie tool um, with a, an extra security benefit in that Blockstream has one of the signing keys. And the entire original design for this, though, um, <clears throat> involved a time lock transaction that would allow you to get your funds back without Blockstream signing key if anything were to happen with that. But the issue is that was a pre-signed um, time lock transaction. So you effectively had to put your email in and connect your email to this wallet to actually receive that. So now um, they've tweaked things and finally gotten around to an update change that at least I think has been in the pipelines for quite a while. Instead of using pre-signed transactions, they actually have a branched um, two path script that they use now um, where one path is at any time your key and Blockstream's key can sign and move the coins. And the second path, only your um, key is needed, but after a CSV relative time lock. So now rather than having to be sent a pre-signed transaction every time you transact, um, it's all just handled in the script on chain. So that time lock um, would reset itself every time you move a UTXO on chain. And if anything were to ever happen to Blockstream, um, that just naturally degrades to, I think, over a year um, or after a year, only your key is necessary to sign the funds. Um, there's no longer any need to do anything interactive to give an email address to make use of that feature. It all just happens on chain. And with the update for this, um, effectively, if you start a new wallet, it's just using this by default. But if you had been using green prior to this, Pretty much every time you transact or receive new funds, it's going to lock the new funds up um, using this method or um, say the change output, lock them up with this method. And honestly, I think this is a huge improvement in terms of security model. Um, no longer need to interact or you know, kind of dox an email address to Blockstream, but there are two things um, that this kind of glosses over. Um, one, it's going to be more expensive to use this wallet and to actually spend those funds because the 
actual script locking things up is bigger and more complex. And two, um, until we get to the point of all wallets talk mini script, and you can kind of just drop new scripts um, very easily into wallets, um, th this pretty much breaks compatibility to spend these coins with anything but Blockstream Green, um, because most wallets are just going to take your pub key, put it into a standard script, and then check the blockchain for it. And this is a, a custom non-standard script. So unless other wallets directly support this, or we get to the point where you can drop mini script stuff into them and just make them support it, um, this is kind of further locking your coins into the Blockstream software ecosystem. But given the fact that this is kind of catered towards normies and holding their hands, um, as like a 2FA or extra security measure, I mean, that might be worth the trade off, but that's just kind of two things to consider there that less technical people might not put together looking at this. I thought you'd be more excited that something deleted the, the need for an email address. Yeah, that that is cool. Um, I was being distracted by a picture of someone apparently protesting uh, on Wall Street with signs labeled XRP and Bitcoin, unfortunately. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, one of the not so cool things that I saw yesterday was that the NYPD counterterrorism unit tweeted a selfie of two, I mean, there must have been three because there had to be one to take the picture, but the picture had two officers, one of which was holding a very large gun, uh, and they were guarding the Wall Street bull. <laughs> yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> my, my first thought was, uh, where, where's Donnie Darko when you need him? We must defend Wall Street from this insurrection. From erections, I guess. <laughs> Capital erections. That's what candles are, Shinobi. They're capital erections. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Onward with Blockstream happy hour. <laughs> so, in addition to Blockstream Greens updates, the Blockstream satellite feed has also gone through an upgrade. So, primarily, um, they have dropped the minimum bid um, necessary to broadcast data um, down to a single millisatoshi for byte, so by a factor of 50. Um, and pretty much um, without bidding pressure, um, jacking up the price that allows a one megabyte file to be broadcast down the stream for around 30 cents. So the network is now cheap enough ignoring... Um, you know, any bidding pressure that happens during um, I want to blast things down from space. Uh, it's now not just text messages, but, you know, this is a lot cheaper um, and can facilitate things like video images, um, you know, maybe potential constant streaming um, use cases and things like that. So, woohoo! It's way cheaper to try and beam things down from space if you have any applications in mind that might want to do that. And as well, um, we covered the last episode, I think, um, their new LN sync service to help uh, Lightning nodes catch up on changes in the Lightning Network routing graph with a lot less data. Um, this is now also being um, beamed down through the satellite feed by default. And They've also rolled a few um, previously external scripts that were used for um, broadcasting and receiving text messages into the actual command line client used to interact with the feed. So, woohoo! Um, things got way cheaper. Um, hopefully, people start thinking about fun stuff to build um, that maybe was not so. Uh, you know, profitable or practical previously. And now we have the lightning network beaming down from space and not just the blockchain. It's a true lightning network now. Woohoo! I'm not gonna lie. I am really kind of, I, I really hope this like 
spurs more interest in thinking about what you can build on top of that feed just in terms of applications because honestly i have been really disappointed at the lack of any kind of app or project or anything building on top of this since it was launched podcasts that is within the realm of possibility now Blockstream digest we're, we're already there. We're halfway there, so might as well go all the way. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just had to check with Samson about how I'm allowed to respond to that. One, one, one second. You don't answer to no one. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, I, I remember when this first launched, somebody was doing, um, like, news broadcasts. Um, or like little digest snippets um, regularly through this. And like, just really think about how useful that could be in different parts of the world, like with actual totalitarian control over the media and the flow of information. I mean, one person can just set up a satellite dish and bzzz. Mm-hmm. Anyway, last thing up in the Blockstream happy hour, um, really just a quick thing. Uh, Blockstream is expanding their mining operations um, with an agreement um, to purchase $25 million of what miner um, or what's miners from MicroBT, um, the company that was founded by the former Bitmain engineer that kind of exploded and ate up a bunch of market share over the last couple of years. So, uh, yeah, more hornets go zzzz. And thus concludes the Blockstream happy hour. And now we transition to the meth head section. <laughs> a different kind of happy. Let's go. So, in previous episodes 200, 201, 202, and 232, we have covered the case against Virgil Griffith, head of special projects at the Ethereum Foundation, uh, and he, uh, in short, if you don't know, he was arrested and charged in November 2019 with attempting to aid North Korea in evading sanctions in legalese, uh, a 15-month conspiracy to provide services to the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea without the required government approvals. Keyword there, you can uh, you can help North Korea if you get government approval, which he did not have. Um, he got denied uh, the permission to travel there, and he went anyway. Um, if you aren't familiar with this story and need more detail, uh, check out those prior episodes. We also have a lot of discussion that I don't think it needs to be rehashed again, uh, but on uh, January 27th, a few days ago, Judge uh, P. Kevin Castle denied a motion from Griffith's defense that the case be dismissed, and the judge seemed pretty annoyed with uh, the motion to dismiss because uh, one of the first paragraphs after summarizing the basic status of the case starts with, sometimes it is necessary to state the obvious. <laughs> um, <laughs> And the judge, uh, the judge then explains that when there is a grand jury indictment, there is no procedure, generally speaking, for pretrial summary adjudication of a federal criminal prosecution. In part, this is because of deference to the grand jury's finding of probable cause, the high burden of proof imposed on the government, and the relatively limited discovery required under Rule 16. Now, I should point out before I continue that I am not... Uh, big fan of grand juries. I think they're gross. You can read Chelsea Manning's essay on that, um, but this is not about what I want. This is about what the judge has to say. So um, the judge uh, includes a number of citations from the material evidence that has been used by the government so far in filing the charges and will then be looked over at trial. Uh, one of them is that in 2018, Griffith allegedly texted a colleague, we'd love to make an Ethereum trip to the DPRK and set up an Ethereum node. It will help them to circumvent the current sanctions or help them circumvent the current sanctions on them. Now, for anyone thinking, wait, isn't this sort of like those projects that airdrop USB drives and other devices to North Koreans in order to give them some connection to the outside world? 
No, it is not. Um, because as we've talked about in previous episodes, the kind of people that you meet at these conferences are usually not the ones that those projects are trying to reach. And if by chance you do encounter one of those people and they have somehow managed to not get killed while having dissenting views from the ruling state, um, that is an extremely dangerous circumstance that should be handled by someone with actual knowledge and experience in these things. And I have never gotten the impression that Griffith is one of those people. Uh, second, how are you going to run an Ethereum node in North Korea when people struggle to run one in in Western countries with mostly good and uncensored internet? Good luck with that, buddy. Um, uh, one second while I scroll. Uh, further down, the judge writes that dismissal is an extraordinary remedy reserved only for extremely limited circumstances implica implicating fundamental rights um, because and he says that because Griffith apparently argued for dismissal on First Amendment grounds, which is something we've talked about in terms of how applicable that is and how dangerous this case could be, which I agree, it is dangerous to the extent that it could be used to criminalize speech um, and just, just the mere act of traveling to another country with no criminal intent. Um, but uh, apparently Griffith asserts that he was not paid by the GPRK to attend and speak at the conference and therefore did not provide or attempt to provide services. But the judge says that monetary compensation is actually not a necessary element according to his reading of prior cases on this that uh, that it doesn't need to there need there doesn't need to be an actual transaction. Um, Griffith also argued that even if he provided a service, it was statutorily exempt under the information exception because his speech concerned, quote, high level publicly available information. And the judge disagrees. Um, he kind of just says this will be looked into more during the jury trial, but also states even if Griffith's presentation at the conference taken in isolation did not qualify as the provision of services or was exempt under the information exception, evidence at trial may be sufficient to demonstrate his guilt in conspiring to provide services because the, the, the timeline of the conspiracy continues after he leaves North Korea. So the fact, it, like, ev even if what he actually did in North Korea was not criminal, there is a broader, uh, in terms of giving the speech, um, there's like a broader timeline that includes a lot of other things that could contribute to a conspiracy charge. So, yeah, not going well for him. Yeah, if I remember right, didn't he openly, publicly talk about his willingness to personally help the regime figure out Ethereum to get around sanctions? I, I don't think he said that publicly. I think that was, again, one of these messages that was obtained. Um, and as uh, I, I don't know if it's been described actually in prior filings, but this one actually gives a concise summary of like when certain things happened, including the fact that he uh, they claim that he voluntarily gave his cell phone, which the FBI obviously then used to get a bunch of incriminating evidence off of. That seems to be the implication. Um, so, yeah, it sounds like most of it comes from, you know, he tweeted about the fact that he had been approved by, I think it was like a mission of North Korea in New York City, but then he didn't get approval from the State Department. Uh, but that that part was public, but the rest is all text messages to one or more colleagues and then also to members of his family. Yeah, I don't know in what world he thought that he could get this case dismissed. <laughs> like, I mean, that that's a shitty situation to be in, but like, I think you might want to get a better lawyer. Well, I mean, it's kind of... With with any kind of legal case, the kinds of arguments that lawyers make, you know, they don't necessarily make them because they believe they'll be effective. It may just be a stalling tactic. Um, who knows? Like, that doesn't necessarily mean that the lawyers are not good. But yes, the argument obviously was not good. Very bad. You don't condescend to judge. That doesn't usually go well. 
So yeah, it looks like uh, we will talk about this next when the trial starts. Yep. yep. I wonder if Vitalik will be there. Oh, that would be fun. But like, yeah, seriously, once again, like, regardless of the precedent that this could set, um, I am just still extremely annoyed by naive people who think they can just parachute themselves into countries like this. And like, again, it's not, it's not explicitly clear from, I, as far as I can recall, it's not explicitly clear from his messages whether he was intending to help specifically the North Korean government or just North Koreans in general. But either way, it's extremely naive to think that you could, like any of the things he was talking about, it's extremely naive that he thought he could do any of these things. And it's also naive to think that the US government would not take an interest in this. One, because it's Ethereum, which is involved in a number of pending legal situations and also because north korea yep like of all i i i just i don't know what what did he think was going to be accomplished by running an ethereum node in north korea like what are they are they going to oh god i almost made a gas joke that is not appropriate um yeah don't do that ethereum is not going to save north korea nope Alrighty, so are we ready for a little shift in Coinbase's plans? What could that be? Well, as usual, um, unlike you, I can't remember the episode, but um, a while back we talked about Coinbase filing an S1 um, with the SEC for an IPO. And apparently what they want to do now is go with a direct listing. So generally in an IPO, um, an underwriter gets involved to help coordinate um, sales. And this generally works um, effectively as an auction uh, of new shares. Um, or the underwriter effectively finding um, buyers themselves. And this kind of comes with a lot of trappings, you know, such as, um, you know, promoting that. Um, it's a lot easier and very common for large um, purchases of shares with agreements to not sell for long periods of time. And, um, kind of a lot of safeguards against volatility from the company's point of view. Um, whereas a direct listing um, pretty much just dumps it right into the market with no new shares being created, um, only existing shares um, existing to be brought to market. And none of those real <clears throat> protections or, or structure that come with a, uh, a non-direct listed IPO. And I'm really not sure what to make of this. Like, is Coinbase doing this um, because they don't think this will go well? Which wouldn't really make sense to me. And just trying to, um, you know, kind of get it done and cash out. Or are they hoping that, you know, there is enough hype and demand right off the bat with a direct listing that they can um you know just sell existing shares and make more out of it that way um not really quite sure you know which one of those they're thinking here <laughs> mm -hmm. i mean i i do not think in a million years it, it would happen but i would love to see coinbase go public and then just dump <laughs> But yeah, so uh, Coinbase is uh, switching it up a little bit with their IPO plans. And to what end, I am not exactly sure. But yeah, w what's up with uh, really dumb responses in legal cases, Janine? I, I think we have another one of those. Well, um, as we talked about in the episode titled XRP, 
pee pee pants or something. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> that, that was it. Um, yeah, so uh, Ripple has uh, announced that uh, they have filed their response to the SEC complaint. Um, and they have some things to say. Um, they say, since the SEC filed its complaint at the end of December, its side of the story has been the only one shared publicly. <gasps> so sad. Our initial response was finally filed today. The answer is a legal document filed publicly. As, as like I find it funny that they have to spell that out, which, as the name suggests, is our official answer to the allegations in the SEC's complaint. Although it does not fully outline our strategy, more to come as it plays out in court. <laughs> it's our first, that's literally what they write. Um, it's our first opportunity to start to set the record straight. Although the legal process is slow, we are working to get this resolved as quickly as possible to bring clarity to the broader market. Moving quickly is important because, as you know, since the SEC filed its complaint, XRP lost almost half of its market value, causing retail hodlers of XRP with no connection to Ripple, the very people the SEC purports to protect, to suffer billions of dollars in losses. <laughs> so some of their arguments include... Um, XRP is not an investment contract, uh, they explain. The only question in this case is a technical one, whether or not Ripple's limited distributions of XRP were an investment contract. To be clear, there are no allegations of fraud, misrepresentation, etc. While we've seen some Twitter commentators suggest this is a non-fraud fraud case, a first-year law student can tell you there is no such thing. It's misleading and irresponsible, not to mention silly, to even suggest otherwise. Okay. Um, and then the rest of their arguments are basically the SEC uh, is, I think they say, out of step. Um, and let me go check. Yeah, they say the SEC is out of step. Uh, then the SEC is picking winners and losers. And the SEC has distorted facts. Um, let's see what they say about picking winners and losers. Although XRP is the most inefficient digital asset for global payments benefiting consumers around the world and is the most environmentally stable crypto. <laughs> what? There is no principal distinction between XRP's current function and that of BTC or ETH. Oh, really? How does the SEC explain telling the public that BTC and ETH are not securities, then turning around and alleging the opposite is true for XRP. <laughs> are they really going to argue that? That yep. Bitcoin, oh my God. Like, um, let's see, how do I say this? Um, first of all, there is no ripple for Bitcoin. Um, yeah, case closed. Um, <laughs> Black stream. Yeah. Maybe. Um, what's particularly interesting here is that at one point, the SEC claimed that ETH might have been born a security. <laughs> I love that phrase, born a security. I was born this way. Um, but eventually evolved into a non-security, offering no guidance or framework for this determination. Um, hey, Ripple, just, just for a clue, it's because, um, yeah. It's because ETH kind of is a security. They just got it wrong. But um, anyway, we're just asking for rules to be stated clearly and for those rules to be applied consistently across the board. We sent a FOIA request to the SEC asking for more information about how the determination was it. Okay, okay. This is like the one silver lining of this thing. If we get a good answer to their FOIA request about how they came to the conclusion about ETH and maybe if they know some things that we don't. Uh, probably not. <laughs> There's a lot of public evidence, but anyway. Furthermore, XRP is a great deal more environmentally friendly than BTC and ETH, considering it avoids the mining process. The power needed to mine and validate BTC transactions leaves an enormous car- Why are they talking about this? This has nothing to do- <laughs> This has nothing to do Get with woke, the SEC complaint. Broke. This has nothing to do with the SEC complaint whatsoever. Compared to the modest amount of energy consumed by XRP transactions- that must matter from a policy perspective. Actually, it doesn't, because the complaint has nothing to do about the energy use <laughs> of, of Bitcoin or any of these coins, so boo. <laughs>
Finally, they conclude, I want to thank Team Legal for all of their hard work on this, and on behalf of Brad, recognize the broader Ripple team for staying focused on executing against our vision while we... What? Wait, there's a Ripple team, and Brad is a part of it? Or on behalf of Brad, we're thanking the Ripple team? And, yes. Signed, someone named Stu. Great lawyer. But, 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 but if we're a security, how do we pump on the Great Reset? We, we build Bitcoin better. See, all they have to do is find something more memeable than a Shiba Inu. I don't think that's possible. Chicken tenders. Nah, I think the, the Doge wins. Damn it, I really want chicken tenders. Oh boy. Ripple, ripple, ripple. So that concludes this segment on Ripple has changed their pants. <laughs> oh man. Alrighty. So. This next thing um, really, really gives me bad vibes. So for those who don't remember, um, Marathon Patent Group is the latest um, government cucking, um, going to censor things, mining pool to come to this space. And they just announced they are sponsoring Chonish Schnelli for his work on Bitcoin Core. Oh. Yeah. And I really, on one side, um, just get fucked, um, period, trying to throw money around in this space, um, given what they're, they're doing. Um, fuck you. Just fuck off. And on the other side, um, I have to ask, like, does Jonas Schnelli just like, you know, look around for like the shadiest company in the space he can possibly find to get, you know, sponsorship for his developer work? Um, first Bitmain and now Marathon. Huh. Makes you think. It really does. But, uh, yeah. So that's a thing. And yeah, that should not be. Um, I, I'm really kind of shocked that a core developer would accept money from a company openly saying they are going to censor transactions and apply government regulations to which things they put in a block as miners. Like there, there is no semantics here about is bitmain an enemy of bit like th th this group is attacking bitcoin that's what this company what this mining pool is doing and they are effectively trying to goad on regulations to force other miners to attack bitcoin in the same way why in the fuck would any self-respecting developer in this space take money from that company but Shinobi, money is just money. Mm hmm. Which explains why I'm poor. <laughs> and paid speeches are just paid speeches. Yep. So, yeah. I guess that takes us to the last thing of the day. And anybody listening, I actually might want to give it a day or two. Um, if or bleh, if you want to give this a spin, because um, there are some bugs right now. But Commerce Block has just dropped the first um, GUI beta version of their Mercury wallet um, supporting their implementation of state chains. And this is pretty much just right now um, completely um, isolated um, with kind of fake coins that are not even on a test net. Um, that's kind of one of the things there's uh, some issues with. Um, but they dropped this out there just to kind of let people play around and see what the user experience they put together are. And um, hopefully sometime soon, um, in the first part of this year, they're planning on shifting this over um, onto the actual test net um, instead of just little pseudo local coins to play with the UI and um, expand testing to that. And hopefully... Um, 
sometime before the end of 2021, we actually get an operational wallet and coordinator for a state chain on mainnet. Because, um, yeah, there's been so much buzz and work and development on the Lightning Network the past three years um, or so. I really want to see um, some of the other ideas for second layers and tools like this to actually, um, you know, you can't really improve and expand something until the original is actually running. Um, yeah. And there are a lot of nifty use cases for state chains that don't quite map to lightning. So uh, let's start building more second layers and stop acting like lightning is the end all be all of the universe. Ditto. And that concludes today's episode of Wall Street Bets. Um, got any final thoughts? Uh, well, it won't probably matter too much to the people who listen to this as a podcast download, but for the people who are actually here, uh, it would be great if you could consider signing this petition to encourage the Nobel Peace Prize formal nominators to... Uh, consider Julian Assange because he has been nominated for the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize. And yes, caveat, um, the Nobel Peace Prize historically has been awarded to a mixture of people um, on the ethical spectrum, but it would, in terms of public perception, help a lot to possibly get him out of Belmarsh prison, despite the fact that his extradition was denied this month. So yeah, um, and for anyone who doesn't know, I'm sure a lot of people who listen to the show do, but the reasons listed on the petition at the Action Network um, is as follows. He should be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for publishing the Iraq war logs, which exposed war crimes, uncovering the collateral murder video of a journalist who was killed by the U.S. Army, releasing crimes committed by the U.S. State Department in Cablegate, raising the curtain on prisoners at Guantanamo Bay in the Gitmo files, removing the shroud of secrecy around the Scientology cult, publicly listing the members of the far-right British National Party, publishing Spy Files Russia, by the way, for anyone who thinks that WikiLeaks doesn't publish stuff on Russia, all you have to do is go to wikileaks.org and search Russia, and you'll find it. Um, which detailed Russian operations in Syria, exposing corruption in Turkey involving the Ministry of Energy, and introducing revelations that the Saudi and Qatar governments were backing ISIS and Nal Nusra. So yeah. If you can, I think there's less than 200 signatures needed out of 6,000 or so. So uh, if you can sign it and share it around, that would be great. Hope, uh, unfortunately, I think the um, the period for, I uh, would have to check, I think the period for nominations closes tomorrow or something. I can't remember, but there's a deadline that ends today. Um, so yes, that is why there is a time constraint. I can't help myself. I have to do it. Um, I'm going to link below um, Janine's petition, my counter petition to award the Nobel Peace Prize to Black Lives Matter for their heroic <laughs> demonstration this summer of how to apply mostly peaceful protest to enact change. I launch... <laughs> I launched my counter counter petition to nominate Wall Street bets for the Nobel Peace Prize in using pleb market manipulation to expose Wall Street and their financial crime for peace. All right, <laughs> All right folks, I guess uh, the end of this episode is pick your petition. With your chicken tendies. But yeah, in, in all seriousness, though, um, get out there and sign Janine's first petition, punks. All right, we, we, we got anything else? Any parting memes? Uh, let me think. Well, the, um, the uh, chicken tendies initiation poem uh, ends with, My foul smell bowel dwelling diaper surprise, For she who is unpooped on is she who remembers, Never forget my chicken tenders. And on that note, Shinobi Shit is coins. going to get some chicken tendies. <laughs> Catch you later, punks. Shit all over Wall Street.
Yeah, I'm gonna have to